The headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. The worst of the explosions gutted the Deepwater Horizon stem to stern. Crew members were cut down by shrapnel, hurled across rooms, and buried under smoking wreckage. Some were swallowed by fireballs that raced through the oil rig's shattered interior. Dazed and battered survivors, half-naked and dripping in highly combustible gas, crawled inch by inch in pitch darkness, willing themselves to the lifeboat deck. It was no better there. That is the opening line of the New York Times expose on one of the biggest stories of 2010, the BP oil spill. It's been eight months since the explosion aboard the Deepwater Horizon set off the worst offshore oil spill in U.S. history. Eleven workers were killed, and over 200 million gallons of oil were dumped into the Gulf of Mexico. Earlier this month, the federal government took the first legal action to come out of a series of probes suing BP and eight other companies for cleanup costs and environmental devastation under the Clean Water Act and the Oil Pollution Act. Attorney General Eric Holder unveiled the case. The United States alleges violations of federal safety and operational regulations, including a failure to take the necessary precautions to secure the Macondo well prior to the April 20th explosion, failure to utilize the safest drilling technology to monitor the well's condition, failure to maintain continuous surveillance of the well, and failure to utilize and to maintain equipment and materials that were available and necessary to ensure the safety and protection of personnel, property, natural resources, as well as the environment. More lawsuits are expected as governmental investigations proceed. But some companies have been accused of obstructing fact-finding efforts to determine liability. On Wednesday, Transocean, the owner of the Deepwater Horizon rig, said it won't honor subpoenas issued by investigators with the U.S. Chemical Safety Board. The board has challenged Transocean's monitoring of testing on the blowout preventer that failed during the explosion and that has accused the company of withholding key documents and barring access to witnesses. Transocean says the board doesn't have proper jurisdiction. Well, this week, The New York Times came out with a major investigation into how the explosion aboard the Deepwater Horizon occurred. Based on interviews with 21 crew members, testimony from 94 others, the investigation concludes every single one of the rig's defenses failed. According to the piece, the defense mechanisms either didn't work, were activated too late, or weren't deployed at all. David Barstow is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist for The New York Times. He wrote the oil spill piece with David Rode and Stephanie Saul. It's called Deepwater Horizon's Final Hours. David Barstow joins us here in our studio. Welcome to Democracy Now! This is an exhaustive investigation. You spent five months on it. Um, and I think what's most powerful about it are the individual stories you tell of the workers on board. But what why don't you, in these last hours of 2010, lay out for us what happened? Tell that story as they did, um, one of the biggest stories of 2010. Well, you have this, um, this oil rig, which we've all seen photographs of, this enormous structure uh, 50 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico. And it went down after the oil spill, and I think many people sort of assume that it was like an inevitable kind of casualty of the blowout itself. But in fact, this oil rig was kind of like the Titanic. I mean, it was this um, incredible apparatus, this um, marvel of engineering, and it had all of these systems, these safe safety systems, um, state-of-the-art, many of them, that were all designed to prevent the very thing that happened from happening. And not only that. Um, what also was striking about this is that it had a crew um, that was trained, uh, trained frequently on how to respond to blowouts, how to respond to fires, how to get off the rig quickly. Um, and, and it also had leaders on this rig who had decades of experience in drilling in deep water environments, and they knew all about blowouts, kicks, well control problems. And yet, on this night, on April 20th, every one of those systems, every one of those rehearsals, drills, et cetera, it all failed, and failed miserably. Um, and it didn't fail because people were, um, you know, wanted something bad to happen or were not trying to do the best that they could. But what we discovered was that there was a kind of paralysis that gripped this vast rig in critical places at critical times. And what it 
resulted in is it resulted in people not taking the steps, not deploying some of these safety systems, uh, or trying to deploy them, but deploying them too late, um, when, it, when the damage had already been done. Uh, and, and the net effect of this paralysis is that for nine minutes from when the blowout first hit the rig until these crippling explosions that basically left this a dead ship, those nine minutes, there was no alarm, general alarm, issued to the 126 people who were on this rig. So for most of the people on the rig, the first time they really understood that there was a major crisis going on was when the explosions uh, uh, ripped through this this uh, oil rig, and in many cases injuring people, in some cases quite, quite devastating injuries, burns, broken bones, that kind of thing. Well, David, it, it is a fascinating account, and as I told you before the show started, it's not every day that I read a full uh, New York Times multi-page uh, story, but this one really read like a novel in terms of what actually happened, and especially, as you, as you say, it wasn't just a failure of the equipment, but there were several uh, moments when key decisions were made by these experienced people that had they made the decision one way, yes. there would have been a, a far different result. And I'm wondering if you could go through some of those uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, beginning from what they were doing, actually, which was actually monitoring the, uh, the well itself before capping it and then and then going through some of the key uh, key mistakes that occurred. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways that I, I, I put it in the piece was that this rig was like a kind of a Gulf Coast town that was well prepared for Category 1 hurricanes but never contemplated what they would do when they were hit with a 100-year storm. And it was sort of—you could see this even in the training policies. They were given very big, thick guidelines from Transocean, the owner of this rig, on how, when they should deploy these various systems. But there was a, a kind of a contradiction in these policies. The policies would say, you really need to act quickly. It's crucial. The history of oil rig disasters is the history of small problems that don't get addressed right away. And yet they would also say, but there's a really big danger if you overreact. And if you overreact, then it could cost us a lot of money. It could create other safety issues. Uh, and you see moments along the way where that contradiction essentially froze key people at key times. And the best example I can think of it on this point is what happened on the bridge. You have the bridge of this rig, you have a captain, you have other officers, and uh, um, several minutes into this crisis, all of a sudden the computer consoles started lighting up with gas alarms. And there are gas alarms that are, there are detectors all over this rig that are constantly sensing and detecting even the slightest trace of gas. And when they detect really high levels of gas, the alarms are colored magenta. And all of a sudden, on these computer consoles in the bridge, there were dozens of magenta lights lighting up. Well, the officers on this rig had trained uh, on what you do when you see a magenta light or uh, one alarm going off. And they had a whole sort of procedure set up. First you acknowledge the alarm, then you silence the alarm, then you call the captain, you call the other supervisors, you send somebody with a handheld detector to go check the area, confirm the alarm, then you come back. And it, and, and it contemplated a, such a much smaller kind of crisis. But when they were confronted with dozens of alarms going off all at once, they didn't know what to do. They hadn't been trained for that moment. And they said, quite frankly, you know, we just didn't know what to do. Um, likewise, they have another right at the same console where they have these magenta lights going off. They have another system that allows them to shut down ventilation systems, shut down electrical systems to prevent uh, a source of ignition. Uh, they even have a button that would shut down the main engines on the rig, uh, which were the, the things that ultimately exploded so devastatingly in this, this rig. But they, this is a system that is incredibly complex. One of these systems takes 30 different buttons that you have to pick from in order to deploy it and deploy it 
under the crunch of time, if you can imagine, put yourself in the shoes of those people on that bridge. The system had initially been designed to be automatic. Transocean set some of these systems so that they basically required a human being to make the correct decision at the correct time, armed with the correct information. You kind of needed a triple bank shot of all the right things to occur. And what happened again and again and again that night was that you didn't have the right people with the right information, with the right systems. And what happened was this kind of paralysis. Why did they stop it from being automatic? For a variety of reasons. Transocean now argues that on a sophisticated rig operating in these conditions, that it can actually be more dangerous if you have automated systems. They also argued that if you have alarm systems um, that trigger automatic um, uh, evacuation sirens all the time, and those turn out to be false alarms, that uh, it'll be sort of the cry wolf syndrome, and people will stop listening and reacting. Um, in the same way. We're going to go to break and then come back to Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter David Barstow, who led the investigation uh, five months into the final hours of the Deepwater Horizon, uh, looking at what they call on board the vessel, the well from hell. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.